I'm going to ask you now to open your Bibles with me to Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. There's a, there's a reason that we're going to talk about this um, text today is not only are we just continually teaching our way through the New Testament, but there's something I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring to us as individuals who look to God for our salvation to realize his backing with us and share the gospel and live in the light of of the truth of the gospel. And Paul now begins this portion of his letter to the Galatians who were being infiltrated by Jewish religious systems to go back into circumcision and the law. And he writes this portion of scripture in chapter 2. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter uh, arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for one moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whether whatever they were makes no difference to me, God does not judged by external appearances, those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in this ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles." James, Peter, and John, those um, reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. And they asked that, uh, they, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Uh, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews uh, joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. But when I saw what they, uh, that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you uh, force Gentiles to follow, follow Jewish custom? We who are Jewish by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we um, seek to be justified in Christ becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for Christ. I have been justified with Christ um, 
I've been, excuse me, I've been crucified with Christ, and, and no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ who lives in me. The life that I live in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for, the, uh, for if the righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Isn't it interesting how Satan will really target the seed of God's promise and he will target the truth that will transform lives and cultures and the world. And so he goes after to dilute the gospel with something with the gospel, which really takes away the gospel and focuses it back, in this case, on keeping the law. Well, Paul who was called by Jesus, was a Pharisee. He was really into the law. He was more zealous for the law than any other Pharisee, he says. And yet, when he came to understand who Christ was, when he came to understand salvation by faith, he began to throw away his religious background. He says, I, I count it lost. I put it behind me. I count it as garbage so that I may gain Christ. And he realized that he had been apprehended by God and he had been entrusted by God to go to the Gentiles with the gospel. And as he goes to the Gentiles with the gospel, he suddenly realized the backing that he had from God in heaven. And so this was not just his idea. As a matter of fact, he used the word in one translation, I've been apprehended by God. God apprehended me. He took me. And uh, it wasn't my idea. And Paul was not trying to start something new that was his idea. He had been apprehended by Jesus Christ. And he understood the backing of Christ in the gospel. And so when this thing came, when false brothers came in to, to spy out the freedom of these Gentiles, and they were really um, trying to bring Christ and the law to a group of Gentiles, and they began to argue that these Christian guys needed to be circumcised. And it says that a sharp dispute arose, and Paul was not going to stand for one minute. He was not going to entertain it. He was not going to allow it to be taught, and he made a strong stand, exposed him for false brothers, and got radical in front of the church. And we're glad he did. Because he realized that he had been entrusted with something that he was not to budge on. Folks, there's a lot of things to budge on in this life. We're not to be hard-nosed people. We're not to be um, unteachable. But there are some certain foundational truths that we stand on that we're not to budge on. And um, we're finding out that in our culture today, um, we have this kind of individualization kind of value that we have to value what other people that are different than us. And, and, and there's a goodness about that sense, but there's also a sense of, of, wait a minute, there are some absolutes here. And God has gone to a great investment to send his son from heaven to show the way. Uh, do you know that Jesus ministered three and a half years on this planet and do you know that the average synagogue would open up the scroll and it would take them three and a half years to read through uh, the, the first few books of the Bible? And as, as the law was read and Jesus entered that day and read Isaiah 61, 1, he, he said, today this is fulfilled in your midst. And he began to live out and practice piece by piece what was being read in the synagogues, he actually put it into motion. When it talked about the healing of a leper, he was healing a leper. When they lit the, the candles in the temple, he declared, I am the light of the world. And he said, I came to fulfill the law. And so God has this tremendous investment in time and history to invade our world. And there are certain absolutes that we are to stand fast on. And God backs us when we stand fast to the truth. Now, Paul said here in this passage of Scripture that he um, came to Jerusalem by revelation uh, of the gospel to go back to Jerusalem and present to the apostles the gospel that he had received personally from the Lord. Do you remember last week we talked about how Paul was protected he was per actually protected 
from the apostles. God kind of set him aside. He wanted to hang out with the apostles. As a matter of fact, he wanted to minister to the Jews. And, and the Lord appeared to him one night and says, they won't let receive your testimony. Go far away to the Gentiles. And that was shocking to Paul because he thought that he was really tooled to minister to Jewish people. And so he obeyed and he went. And God began to unfold that justification by faith apart from the law was the true gospel. And this was revolutionary uh, in Jerusalem. And so he goes back to the leadership of the early church who are still in Jerusalem. And he presents this gospel. Notice what it says. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation that had been set before them, the gospel that I preached uh, to the Gentiles. Now, in Acts 15, we see this Jerusalem council. If you read on later, it says that these false brothers infiltrated the troops there in in Antioch to try to get the, the Christians tuned into the law and get them circumcised. And uh, Paul, you know, said, no way, uh, you can't teach that. It's a lie, and you're wrong, and it's false. It's like, well, you're misled, you know, it's okay. Like, no, you're wrong, and you can't teach that here. Uh, and then as he did that, a big argument erupted. And uh, Paul must have got the revelation to take this argument to Jerusalem. And that God, through this, through this argument, was going to force the church to deal with an emerging truth that God was presenting for them, that, to, to recognize that he was doing, that they had not really wrapped their understanding around. And so a lot of times, I begin to see how God works in our lives. There are times in my life and in your life where certain things happen, and it's very unpleasant. Maybe it's an argument with a family member. Maybe, maybe something has happened in your life and you really don't like it. But what it is, it's God using something to force something to the surface so that people will recognize something God is doing and deal with that. And that's really what God is doing. How did he birth that into the early church? Well, here's Peter, James, and John in Jerusalem. What did Jesus tell him in the book of Acts chapter 1? He said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Where were they? They were still in Jerusalem. And God was birthing this thing out away from Jerusalem as Jerusalem, as the Holy Spirit came first in Jerusalem, and it exploded there with some healings and the, the Pentecost in chapter 2. And then by the time they stoned Stephen and they saw his face lit up like an angel, just like Moses coming down from a mountain as a witness to a nation, they rejected and stoned him. They had rejected Jesus and stoned him. Now they're rejecting the spirit, and the gospel goes out. From that point on, there's a turning point of what God is doing in dealing with the Jewish nation. No, he's not done with them, as it says in Romans 9, 10, and 11. They were going to come back, and God's going to deal with them in the last days. But right now, God is, it's the times of the Gentiles, and God has taken for himself a bride. And Paul is this guy who's got who's got the revelation that, that, the, that the Jerusalem church hasn't caught on to yet. They've kind of caught on because Peter had gone on the roof and was hungry. And this un sheet of unclean animals are let down. And the Lord says, rise, kill, and eat. And he says, wait a minute, those are pigs. And I've never had a ham sandwich. And I, I don't think I should do that. I'm, I'm a clean man. I'm Jewish. And God says, hey, Peter, if I made it, it's clean. Rise, kill, and eat. And this happened three times. And then there was a knock at the door. And it was some, some divine appointment that God had sent to them by a guy, a Gentile, a Roman soldier named Cornelius. And he was inquiring of the Lord and had a visit from an angel. And it says, go get Peter. And Peter, actually, to, for him to go into a Gentile house was breaking the law. But God says, look, I'm bigger than the law. I'm doing something bigger. You don't understand. Just go with these people. And he had to have a revelation, and God had to break through his prejudice three times with this vision to get him to even go and consider something. And he was surprised when he went in and said, now, why did you call for me? You know it's illegal for me to be here with you guys. Why did you call me? He said, well, we had this angel come and visit us as I was praying. And God said, I know who you are, and I love you. 
and you don't understand who I am, so go get Peter. And so here, we came and got you. Talk, talk to us. I've got my whole family here. And as Peter began to share the truth of Scripture, the Holy Spirit fell on this Gentile. And it says those people were shocked because these people, as they heard the Word of God, they received the Holy Spirit and began to manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they were shocked that Gentiles could receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so God was trying to break through, but they're still not getting it. And Paul, who has been on the backside of the desert, kind of rearranging his thinking and his theology, and how could I miss God so big? And, and now what is God doing? And he had this promise, and he had this word from God that go away, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. And that didn't make sense. And he's away in the backside of the desert, and he's studying the Old Testament scriptures, and he's trying to figure this thing out. And it begins to unfold before him, and God entrusts him with a new mystery that's going to change the world. And then he goes. Do you remember? Uh, they were first called Christians in Antioch, and when the Gentiles started responding, Barnabas remembered uh, Paul because he was the only one that believed in Saul becoming Paul and being converted. And he stood behind him, and he, he made the brothers accept him, and he gave verification to his testimony of how he had experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus and how his world had been upside down. He had been blinded by a light and heard this voice, and those with him heard, but they did not understand, and he was blinded, and he was, care he was led into Damascus. And God, through a supernatural visitation, told Ananias to go pray for him that he would be healed and filled with the Holy Spirit and be baptized. And so he was. And Barnabas was the one who believed in Saul. And when God began to bring Gentiles to himself, Barnabas remembered, oh yeah, that's what God He's telling Paul, I'm going to go get Paul. And so he got Paul, they brought him back to Antioch, and Antioch becomes the sending, reaching missionary church for the Gentile nations. Well, anytime a church is going to reach the nations, the enemy is going to try to pollute the church. How many know that? So what happened? These false brothers come in to spy out their freedom in Christ. They go, you know, these guys are eating pork chops. And this can't be God because they're eating pork chops. And uh, they're not circumcising their young babies, their young males. And so this cannot be God. And they're not observing the festivals and the dietary laws, and they're not going to synagogue. They're just praising Jesus. It can't be that easy. You ever meet somebody who can't accept the free grace of God? It's too easy. Folks, let me tell you, the enemy wants to make you religious. Hello. Hello. One of the biggest temptations we have in our sacrifice to God is to become too religious. We've got to become more religious. And so they were susceptible to that. These false brothers come in and start preaching this. And Paul says, get, shut up. Just shut up. You can't talk like that here. It's like he's been back by heaven or something. And a big argument erupted. I like it, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not here just to be difficult, but there are times when contention is good um, in my own life, um, in our own marriage, you know, we, we've had times, I tell people I've been married, is it 31 years, 30, 31. 76, what is that? Yes. And I tell people, I've had 26 years of good marriage. And Judy's had some bad years with me. And sometimes contention is God's way of confronting you with your need to change. And of course, it's only me that needed to change in our case. But... Um, I find that sometimes God uses tension to bring about acceptance and change. And that's what he was doing here in the early church. The fight was of God. It was to stop something from spreading. And it was to cause 
the elders in Jerusalem to catch up with what God was doing in the world. Folks, I don't know why, but the church is often slow in following Jesus in what he's doing in our culture. Do you ever see that? The church is sometimes the slowest to respond to what God is doing in our culture. I just remember the movement that brought me alive to Jesus was in the 70s, and all these hippies were getting saved, and the church was like really against that. And I, I even heard people say it's of the devil. But God was doing something, and it had not been done in the church, and the church was slow to catch on. And I remember in 1975 when I was pastoring my first church at age 21, I remember how radical it was to have a band like this, like we have today, that everybody's like, everybody's doing It's nothing big, nothing new. Everybody's doing the same thing now. But back then, it was like you paid the price to carve the path that you and I now enjoy. There was a lot of tension in the church because the church was not catching on to what God was doing. And I just love how God works I sometimes hate the way God works, but after the fact, I love it. I love the fruits of what God does in the life of his children. And sometimes, folks, that's brought on by facing things in tension and contention within the body of Christ to bring about change and acceptance of what God is doing. Well, this was so new back then that this thing had to be out front where everyone was faced with this issue. And so he went in response to Revelation, and uh, it was made obvious to these, uh, by using false brothers, it was made obvious to uh, the Jerusalem council. And I wish I had time to read that, and it really goes with our text. And if you're in your home groups tonight and you're talking about this text, I would recommend that you read Acts chapter 15. And so... Titus, it says, was kind of the test case. It says, and Titus was with us, and he was not compelled to be circumcised, and uh, he was kind of the test case. It's like, Titus, you're here, you're a Greek, and by Jerusalem consul recognizing that he was a Gentile and not commanding him to be circumcised, he was kind of like a test case. Do you realize that some of the ways that God also brings change in the church is through test cases? I have a friend that pastors a little church, an alliance church in Illinois. And there was a 16-year-old girl who got pregnant. And um, the church did not know how to respond to that. But the pastor said, we're going to have a baby shower for this girl. And we as a church are going to help raise this little child to understand who Jesus is. And we're going to put ourselves behind this girl keeping her baby And some people said to him, well, what about, wouldn't that just give permission to everybody just to do this? Aren't we making it too, you know? And it brought about this kind of content, this tension in the church. But as they prayed and studied through it, they opened a door for Jesus to come in in his mercy in that girl's life. And I can guarantee you that people's transformation are based on God's mercy. How many know that? Personally, I do. And so this church, through causing this contention. So, folks, there is this church. We've, we haven't had big arguments or anything for years and years, and it's been really a fun church to pastor. And, and I don't know if it's partially because we're, we're so much looking, reaching our world, that we don't have time to argue over carpet colors and dumb things that churches split over. We just don't have time for that sort of thing. We don't have energy for that sort of thing. But... God started birthing something in his early church, and God, through contention, sometimes causes truth to be recognized. And, and sometimes it's even a test case, like, okay, here's, here's uh, Titus. He's been used in the gospel. He's, he's recognized. He's used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, what are you going to tell him? Are you going to tell him to get circumcised or not? He could have just caved in and said, well, you know, I just kind of want to get in the flow and not cause contention. He goes, no, I'm going to be there as a point of reference to what God is doing. 
and he did not get circumcised. And it caused them to deal with the issue. And this is some of the ways that God uses to bring about change in the church. Now, notice what, what Paul says about him and Barnabas in verses 6 through um, 10. As for those who seem to be important, whether they, whatever they were makes no difference to me. And I like how he looks at leaders because some of us put leaders up on a pedestal. He says, oh, Peter, James, and John, whatever. They are to God. That's fine. Um, I don't hold anybody to any special place. Um, I recognize God first and have no fear of man. And I'm going to respect the truth more than men. Do you, you get that? I'm going to respect truth more than the respectable men. But yet he's still submitting his gospel to these guys. So he has a place for their calling, but he's not putting them on a pedestal. Are you getting this? And I think that the church needs to wrestle through how we deal with leaders in the church. And, and this is a good point in case. He said, uh, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. They had nothing. When I presented the message, we got nothing to add to it. Great. So it was authenticated and even approved. They had nothing to add. And they said, we recognize that you have been called to the Gentiles and we have been called to the Jews. And folks, there is a certain point when you have to come to grips with who you are in Christ as an individual. I would have thought that Paul would have made an excellent Jewish evangelist. I mean, he was mentored by one of the best and most respected rabbis and scribes of his time. And it, he was so much uh, in the learning curve of his Jewish culture that he was surpassing his, his fellow Jewish rabbis and Pharisees. And his mentor actually said, I need to be taught by you now, Paul. And so he had a lot going that he left behind. And wouldn't you think, well, Paul would have made an excellent Jewish evangelist because look at his credentials. Look who's mentored him. He's on the track of who's who. Wouldn't you think that that guy could relate to the mindset of the Jew better than anyone else? And yet God said to him what? Get out of Jerusalem. They're not going to receive your testimony. I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles. Folks, can I suggest something to you? You cannot invent your own purpose for your own life. You cannot invent your own destiny. You think you know about your life, and from a rational point of view, you could argue your point, but the truth of the matter is, is that real destiny comes when you get to the end of yourself and get to the point of surrender. If you hold to your identity and who you think you are, you will probably never move full blast into God's backing and God's purpose until you get to the point of surrender. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about that in the last couple of verses. But they recognized Paul's calling to the Gentiles. And it says, and they gave us the right hand of fellowship. Right on, brothers, go. We bless you as you go. That's the right hand of fellowship that they went out with. And then we see Paul's authority has, um, was, was realized by Peter in verses 11 through 17. When Peter came to Antioch, now remember, Antioch is the sending church. It's like on the map for reaching the Gentiles. And from Antioch, you and I have had the gospel spilled to us. That's how important and how pivotal this church and this city was in God's dealing with the world. And folks, I don't know about you, but I know God loves the world none, none less than he did back then. And he's looking for people who will welcome him in when they hear him knocking on the outside of his own church and open the door for Jesus to be Jesus. It, I find it interesting, actually, that 
and this is off the subject, but it's on the subject. I find it interesting that a starting point with these 12 guys left behind, or these 11 guys now left behind, and Jesus said, you know, hey guys, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. We're going to start with something small. How about Jerusalem? That's a big city. I would think, start with my life, maybe my wife's life, maybe a friend, and their friends, and maybe a church. But he goes, no, we're going to start with the city. And in God's love for the world, I can't help but see his love for the city. And in the Great Commission, there is this context of city. And when we watch Paul go out, these key cities are the places that he goes. It's the love that God has to transform people and cultures in cities and groupings and communities. And he says that um, I, have, I have the right hand of fellowship to go beyond here to the Gentiles, and he went to these metroplex cities of his day. And everything about Paul was moving him towards Rome, and Rome was the rock and roll city of the world. And I don't mean rock and roll and music, but I mean it was the, um, I need to change my language here. It, it is the happening place of culture that shapes and forms culture. And that's where Paul was going. And he recognized that, and he went with their blessing but when he came to Antioch, this critical, pivotal point city that's going to reach the world, he says, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when he arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Now, folks, it's hard to follow Jesus if you fear people. If you fear a certain group of people and you're going to play up to them, one of the things, the early lessons that Judy and I learned here is that when early on when this church was like 90, we got up to from 45 to about 90 people and people started complaining and we started going around seeing what we could do to work it out to make everybody happy. It wasn't long before we realized there was nothing we could do to please everybody and that's when my wife heard God say to her, live for the audience of one. Just live like there's nobody else to please but me. And, folks, that took a lot of pressure off trying to please. You know, do you know there are a lot of pastors and their whole ministries wrapped around running around trying to please people, making people happy, like there's some sort of politician or something? The minute you become in the role of a hireling, a chaplain trying to please people and service people and make people happy rather than empower people, believe in people, call people out to follow Jesus and identify them and who they are in Christ. The minute that you start serving and petting and just, you know, coddling people because they're going to leave if you don't, that means you're really not following Jesus. You're living in the fear of man. And there's a lot of churches and a lot of pastors who have been trained by a lot of seminaries how to maintain and even use psychology to manipulate boards and committees. What is it like just to fall in love with Jesus and please him and look behind and say, wow, there's a lot of people that want this. They don't want to play church. They're on mission for God. And, folks, that's the kind of church that Muncie Alliance has become. And it's like it's, it's just, it just has blown my mind to watch God do what he's done. He says, I'm going to stack the deck here. I'm going to bring the right people at the right time to do the right things to build my church. It's not Guy Fonce's church. And, it's listen, it's not your church. Somebody bought it with their blood. And it wasn't me and it wasn't you. And we need, as people, to live for the audience of one. Stop this church shopping consumer mentality and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be? How can I follow you? And that's the point that you meet God, and that's where the power of God is. That's where the backing of God is, is when you get past your selfishness and die to self and take on the resurrection life of Christ, and you begin to move out in mission and experience the backing and the power of God on mission. And, folks, that's the secret of the New Testament church. 
They weren't going around taking surveys to see how many people they could make happy. They're going to live for the audience of one. And that's what Paul's doing. And, and Peter's trying to, you know, it's like, well, what will so-and-so think if, I, if, I, if I'm eating with these Gentiles? They may see me slip that pork chop in, you know? And Paul sees this happen. And he's grieved, and he goes up to him, and he, and he calls him out. And the other Jews join him. And, and folks, whenever you get off track, I hate to tell you, but there's probably you're going to lead other people off track. No man lives unto themselves. Whether you're living for God or taking people off in the wrong track, you're going to affect those people around you. You don't live unto yourself. I don't live unto myself. And these other Jewish Christians were sucked in to this fear that Peter had, and they be began to not eat. Oh, we can't eat with you anymore. We're Jewish. And they started withdrawing. Before that, man, it was great fellowship. It was a oneness. It was a church of oneness. It didn't matter if you're Jew, Greek, male, female. Hallelujah. You're Jesus. Then when guys from James came, hey, James, he's Jesus' brother, and he's really Jewish. And he's, you know, back in Jerusalem, pastoring the Jerusalem church. And they're still observing the festivals of Judaism and the Jew Jewish dietary laws. But down here, these Gentiles are eating pork chops. And so what did they do? All the Jewish people began to follow Peter over into hypocrisy. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, Barnabas was led astray. Well, what do you do when you see that? Well, you just kind of take them aside privately. No public things demand public attention. And what did he do? He said, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish custom. Now, by you leaving the Gentile custom, going to the Jews, now those Gentiles, you're going to lead them into Judaism now? Is that what you're doing? We also, we who are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because um, by observing the law, no one is justified. Peter, what are you doing? If we're really justified by faith apart from the law, why are you going back to practicing the law? If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners. And what you're saying is, is if, if, if you're justified by faith and you go back to the law, it's like Jesus' justification isn't really justifying you. That now you've got to be justified by the law. And you've got to go back to this. And he's just pointing out to him that going back to the law is saying that you're not justified and that you're still in your sin. And that you have to keep the law now to keep your sins at bay. And so we have, he says, if while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Now what he's saying here is this. He says, you're a Jew. Yet you've become like a Gentile. You've been set free. Remember the vision on the roof that said you could eat pork chops? Yeah? Well, why are you going back to the law then? Should you build up what you've already torn down? Is that what you want to do? We who are Jews by birth must come to the, the same way to Jesus as the Gentiles come. We come the same way. It's all one, justification by faith apart 
from the law. Folks, if you're here today and you're trying to get good enough so that God will accept you, give it up. You cannot be justified and made right in God's sight by keeping the law. And, and you don't get there by your good outweighing your bad. What's he say to do? Give it up. No one is justified by the law. And so he's pointing this out to Peter. If we're justified in Christ and go back to the law, we're still sinners, making Christ a minister of sin, not of salvation. And that's what he's basically saying. And if we rebuild what is torn down, if you go back on Acts 10 and the vision you had in Cornelius, if you go back on it, you're tearing, you're, you're building back up that which you were used by God to tear down. And now you're building back up the law? For what reason? To say that Christ isn't good enough for salvation? Is that what you're trying to say? And he's like laying it out to Peter. And listen, folks, if we rebuild what is torn down, we leave the promises of the seed of Abraham, where Abraham was made righteous by his faith alone. Before the law even came, Abraham was justified by faith in Christ. So don't go put yourself under some law as if Jesus' justification by faith is not cutting it. And he's just calling Peter out. And he says this, what is the law for them? Well, you say, well, the law is perfect. What's wrong with the law? Well, the law is perfect. But what the law could not do because of the weakness of your flesh and my flesh, God did by sending his own son. And the law is to show you like a mirror of God's perfection. The law is perfect, but it shows you that you are not perfect. How many know today by the law that you're not perfect? You know that. And by the law, you've come to die to the law. For through, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. The only way you can live for God is to see that you can't keep the law and give it up so that you can be justified by faith in Christ alone. Well, some people would say, well, if we throw off the law, how are we going to keep people in line? Well, we'll get to that in chapter 6. So hang on, okay? Here we go. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is Paul saying? What is the sanctified life? Folks, I want to tell you something else. The sanctified life is the life of Christ living in you. You die to your ability to be right. You die to your good desires, and you die to your bad desires. It was a good desire for Peter to want to reach the, gen the Jews. But he had to die to what he thought so that he might receive the mission and the power of God for the Gentiles and that's the power of the resurrection that worked in Paul that made you here today, that's touched you throughout history. And I want to tell you that you must give up and die to your plans and your desires that you might have the life of Christ. Folks, when you get saved, it's not just like you suddenly, all of the, your desires get baptized and everything that you want to do for Jesus is good. No, it, it, it's not all good. Paul had to die to some of that. And I've had to continually die. And some of the biggest promises that God ever gave me, I received with great joy only to find them tested and me to give up and die to those things that Christ might do those things through me. There's too many believers. And I'll get this difference. Don't, I, know it's, I know I'm going to close here right real quick, but just hang with me. Just close. Let me, let me get this part because this is so important. God isn't calling you to be like Jesus. Now, does that shock you enough to listen to what I'm going to say next? God isn't calling you to be like Jesus. There's too many Christians trying to be like Jesus. And guess what? You can't. 
But when you die and Jesus lives in you, it's Jesus in you, not you trying externally to be like Jesus. Jesus is alive in you and coming through. And the life that I live by faith is the life that put me to death has caused a new life to come forth and Jesus is coming out of me and I'm not looking to be like Jesus. Jesus is in me and through me and out of me. And you see, that's different than you and your own energy trying to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? I don't think it's that difficult. Die to yourself and let Jesus live his life through you and you're on mission and you're backed by heaven and you've got power that you've never dreamed possible. Because that's where the power is is where Jesus is moving and working and doing. And he does it through you. And sometimes you don't even recognize that it's him until after the fact. The cool thing is, is when Jesus is in you, it's more natural. It's not external attempts by your determination. It's the life of Christ manifested through you. Do you get the difference? And he says that the life that I now live I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Folks, we got to get to the end of ourselves trying to force ourselves to be Christ-like and let Christ live his life through us. For what the law could not do, weak as it were through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son and by him indwelling in you and the life of Christ in you, your life is changed from the inside out. And you will find yourself doing the things that please God. <clears throat> not by your own determination and not by the energy of your own flesh. It's the life of Christ coming through you as you surrender to him. Folks, the best thing I can tell you to do today is to die to yourself. Die to yourself and let Jesus live his life through you. Let's pray. Lord, we, we've been touched by you. And sometimes because of that, we find that we are more willing to sacrifice and do things than you even want from us. But we want to submit ourselves to you and your word and your truth. We want to find a life that's not contrived by our own energy. We want to find a life that's birthed through us by you and your spirit. Would you come now and set us free? from our own self-righteousness. Would you set us free from living for the audience of men so that we might follow you, we pray. Amen.